Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to FAIR's monthly webinar series. My name is Mike Spigler, and I am FAIR's Vice President of Education. I'll be moderating today's program. Today's topic is on anaphylaxis, and we are honored to be joined by Dr. Robert Wood. Uh, normally, we would take questions throughout the presentation today, but we have already received hundreds uh, of questions that were submitted through the registration form. Dr. Wood has kindly incorporated many of them into his presentation, but if there is something you would like to have answered, please use the chat window or the question window on the webinar screen on your right-hand side, and we will address what we can, time permitting. So with all of that covered, I'd like to introduce Dr. Wood. Dr. Robert Wood is Professor of Pediatrics and Chief of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Wood is an internationally recognized expert in both food allergy and childhood asthma. He has published over 200 scientific articles and numerous book chapters, as well as three books, including Food Allergies for Dummies. Dr. Wood has been a longtime friend to FAIR and even brought the idea of the first patient conference to us uh, some 20 years ago. He also speaks from the heart as someone with a lifelong peanut allergy, so I'd like to welcome everyone, Dr. Wood. Thank you, Mike, and welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. A uh, pleasure to talk about a topic that is uh, important to all of us and near and dear to our hearts and something that raises a lot of confusion, but is, uh, I think uh, some of those questions we can deal with pretty easily. Some are a little bit more complicated, but we're going to really make a, a strong effort today to address as many questions as possible. The objectives are certainly to understand anaphylaxis. Uh, there are a lot of myths about anaphylaxis, so we're going to deal with some of those directly because I think some of those may be uh, a great cause of concern and don't really need to be. We're going to answer, as Mike said, as many questions as humanly possible. Uh, we will be happy to entertain new questions as they come up during the presentation, but since we had so many great questions beforehand, we had a good opportunity to consolidate some of those, pick and choose, and incorporate some of them within the presentation. Now, one thing I can't do, probably the thing most of you are logged on to do, is to provide a specific treatment plan for you or your child. And we will give very uh, a general recommendations. Some of them will get sort of specific, but we can't talk about an individual patient uh, because everyone is different. And even though uh, <clears throat> there may be some uh, of us who think that it would be nice to have a blanket recipe to treat every reaction, that's really not the right way to do it. Uh, I'll, I'll mention up front that the uh, recent death of a teenager has created a lot of added anxiety about anaphylaxis, led to a lot of the questions we're going to address today. And some of the um, uh, uh, response to that death would be, uh, let's just treat everyone exactly the same. But in actuality, it's much better to have an individualized treatment plan that you and your doctor will develop based on you or your child's allergies. So the definition of anaphylaxis is fairly simple. We get hung up on a complicated definition, but it's really pretty easy to think of it as a systemic allergic reaction, and that would differentiate it from a localized allergic reaction. So this is something that's not just a reaction in your mouth or in your nose, but something that's spreading somehow through the body. And in most instances, it will involve multiple organ systems. And on the next slide, we'll talk about what those different parts of the body are that may be involved in anaphylaxis. It's important to remember that it has an acute onset. An acute means that usually symptoms will begin within minutes of exposure, and they will virtually always begin within two hours of exposure. And as you're trying to decide, and we will deal with this in several questions, what symptoms should make me worry about anaphylaxis? We really need to think about that in the context of what you may have been exposed to. And if you've been at home in a safe environment for the last few hours, you're probably not having a reaction to something uh, that is new or different, uh, which is very different from a situation where you may be out in the world where everything is not under your control. If you had a food yesterday, it is not causing a reaction today. That reaction would have begun yesterday, uh, virtually always, again, within two hours of exposure. Now, we think of anaphylaxis always being horrific, dangerous, life-threatening, potentially fatal. But there are anaphylactic reactions, true anaphylaxis, that are relatively mild, 
but they do range to those that are very severe, and those that are very severe can be life-threatening and sometimes even fatal. Now, we're going to focus on food-induced anaphylaxis today, but just to mention up front, other common causes of anaphylaxis, the other two most common along with foods, are stinging insects like bees and wasps and allergies to medications. Latex allergy can cause anaphylaxis. There's a phenomenon of exercise-induced anaphylaxis. There's another one where you only have anaphylaxis when you eat a specific food along with exercise. And it turns out the immunotherapy or allergy shots that we give for uh, uh, regular allergies like a dust or cat allergy or for an insect venom uh, can cause anaphylaxis and actually are a relatively common cause, which is why you need to get allergy shots in a doctor's office where they would be equipped to deal with an anaphylactic reaction. But our focus today obviously is going to be foods and how foods may cause anaphylaxis and how we can address that concern. So the symptoms of anaphylaxis can vary widely, and one of the themes that you're going to hear over and over and over uh, is that the symptoms can not only vary widely from person to person, but from reaction to reaction and from day to day. But when we think about, again, these different parts of your body that may be involved in an allergic or anaphylactic reaction, the skin is the most common, and the skin can show up with flushing or a redness of the skin, with itching, with hives, or with swelling. You can have reactions in the respiratory tract that are in the upper side involving your nose and sinuses that will show up with nasal congestion or a runny nose. They can move down to the lower respiratory system where you can have tightness in your throat or chest, hoarseness, wheezing, cough, difficulty breathing, or shortness of breath. They can involve your stomach, your gastrointestinal system. That can begin immediately upon exposure with itching in your mouth. It can have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. The heart or cardiovascular system can also be involved, and that will lead to low blood pressure or shock, arrhythmias, chest pain. Now, one of the terms that gets thrown around a lot is anaphylactic shock, and anaphylactic shock really only refers to the one variety of anaphylaxis where you have a drop in your blood pressure. And it's important to remember that that is certainly a very dangerous condition, but you can have very dangerous, even fatal anaphylaxis, where your blood pressure is not the problem, where your real problem is that your uh, breathing, your respiratory system has been shut down. And the box at the bottom is a key that I'm going to, again, come back to over and over, that reactions can include any combination of symptoms, and it's common for symptoms to be different with each reaction. That doesn't mean they get worse every time. It doesn't mean they get better every time. It just means they can look very different from time to time. And what you think you look like or your child looks like with a reaction might not look anything like how the next reaction shows up. So the first myth that anaphylaxis always presents with the reactions in the skin. And the truth is, is that the skin is the most common site of reaction in the body but that about 20% of true anaphylaxis cases do not present with anything on the skin. No hives, no itching, no redness. And what scares us the most about this is that when you look at those most severe reactions, those that are life-threatening or fatal, most of those do not involve the skin. So if we're going to use hives as our barometer, to know whether a reaction is happening, that is actually a mistake. You can have hives as the uh, most obvious symptom, or you may have completely clear skin with no itching, no redness, no hives, and be having a severe allergic anaphylactic reaction. And the next myth, and I've alluded to this, but again, it's one of the most important concepts that we should address, and that's that prior episodes predict future reactions. And the truth of this is that there are no predictable patterns, that the severity of a reaction depends on a number of factors. Some of them are very obvious. Some of them are less obvious and um, uh, something that uh, may lead to a lot of uh, unpredictability. But if we think about the first two bullets there, the sensitivity and the dose of allergen, those are what we typically think of as being the two main factors in the equation of how bad a reaction is. And the sensitivity can vary from time to time, although that's not a huge variable. But if we look at people, say, who are outgrowing a food allergy, they are luckily less sensitive over time. 
and will actually have, in all likelihood, less severe reactions as they gradually outgrow their allergy. If we look at an allergy that's pretty stable, then the, then the sensitivity won't vary much. If we look at the typical patient with a peanut allergy, peanut allergy does tend to become more severe through childhood. That does not mean that every reaction will be more severe, but it does mean that if you compare a one-year-old to a five-year-old to a ten-year-old, that ten-year-old is probably more sensitive than they were back when they were one. That means that the sensitivity is somewhat of a moving target. If someone only had hives with their first reaction when they were one, it doesn't tell how they're going to react when they have their next reaction when they're five or ten years old. The biggest variable in a reaction is the dose of allergen you're exposed to. And when you really think about this, uh, if that first peanut reaction occurred with a full tablespoon of peanut butter on a sandwich, and the next exposure is a cross-contaminated cookie with one one-hundredth of a peanut on it, that second reaction is likely to be milder than the first. You can't predict that it would be, but logically, if you get a larger dose of exposure, you're going to react more. If you get a smaller dose, you will react less. Uh, and that is the piece of this equation that is completely unpredictable. We have no idea what the next exposure will be, and that's why if uh, you or your child is deemed to be at risk of anaphylaxis, you need to be prepared for that possibility. And even though that first egg exposure only caused hives on the face, if your doctor really believes that the uh, next exposure could be more significant, uh, you need to be prepared for that possibility, especially if they get a larger exposure. The root of exposure clearly makes a difference. We think of this, especially when we think about all those causes of anaphylaxis, where if you get a bee sting with a direct injection of the allergen, it can be more severe, more quick onset, and more dramatic. But when it comes to foods, we think of three main routes of exposure. We think of ingestion, obviously. We think of airborne, and we think of skin contact. And when we really worry about what's going to cause anaphylaxis, ingestion is going to cause the vast, vast majority, close to 100% of anaphylaxis. You can have an airborne exposure or a skin exposure that is sufficiently large to cause a dangerous reaction, but ingestion is the root of exposure that's going to be of greatest concern. There are other factors that may contribute to the severity of a reaction. One of those is asthma, and the more asthma somebody has, we do believe the higher risk they have of a more severe reaction. And we'll come back and talk about that a few times over the course of this hour. Now, sometimes the asthma can fluctuate as well, though. In somebody who has very sporadic asthma or widely fluctuating asthma might really not have asthma as a big risk factor during those months of the year. Their asthma is perfectly fine. But if we have the misfortune of a food exposure, during that week where your child has a viral infection and a significant flare-up in their asthma, that could be a combination that leads to a much more severe reaction. Exercise is something that we really did not recognize terribly well, in my mind anyway, up until the last few years. And we've always known, as I mentioned, that exercise can cause anaphylaxis, and we've always known that there's a combination of certain foods and certain exercise that in some individuals might cause anaphylaxis. But what we've learned a lot about anaphylaxis, though, over the last few years when we're doing studies looking at ways to treat food allergy. These are the immunotherapy or desensitization studies where we're actually feeding people what they're allergic to. And one of the things that we learned with that is you can react very differently from day to day, and that exercise and infection are some of the things that may make you much more sensitive on one day versus another. But that last bullet is something that I've learned the most about doing these studies, and that's that with no other identifiable factor, you can have significant day-to-day -day variability in the way you react. And in these studies where we're giving people what they're allergic to, you may have someone take the exact same carefully measured dose on a daily basis, and they may be fine for 30 days. They may have a bunch of hives on the 31st day. They may be fine for the next 30 days and then have anaphylaxis on the 61st day. And that is something that um, is um, <clears throat> truly surprising to me as someone who's taken care of uh, tens of thousands of food allergic patients over the last 25 years to see just how great this day-to-day -day variability can be. The time course of anaphylaxis usually falls into what we call a uniphasic pattern. 
And unifasic refers to a single wave of symptoms that once they're gone are truly gone and there's no recurrence or sequelae. And most reactions, thankfully, fall into this category where as bad as it may look for the first 10 or 20 or 30 minutes, an hour into it, you're perfectly fine with no recurrence. We worry a lot, though, about what are called biphasic reactions. And biphasic reactions mean that you have that initial wave of symptoms followed by a second wave of symptoms several hours later. It most uh, typically happens two to four hours later, but can happen up to eight hours, maybe even a little bit longer than that later. And we believe that this happens in about 10 to 20 percent of food-induced reactions. The importance of this is that as good as a child may look, sitting in the emergency room after being appropriately treated with their epinephrine and other medications, we want them observed for at least four hours. And we want them observed because of this possibility of, of a recurrence of symptoms. And it's important to remember that the second wave, if you're unlucky enough to have a biphasic reaction, can be more severe than the first and has even been associated with fatal reactions. There are some very rare cases of protracted anaphylaxis where reactions go on and on and on for hours to days, but these are thankfully very rare. And again, once the reaction settles down, it is usually completely settled down and doesn't even require any more medication later that day or the next day. Now, food-induced fatalities are what scares us the most, and these are thankfully uncommon, but unfortunately do occur. We estimate about 150 deaths in the year in the United States. It's probably a little higher than that because these are not recorded always accurately, but that's the number that we've walked around with for the last 10 or 15 years. And these are not new food allergies typically. These are almost always caused by a known allergy and caused typically by a family who's making every effort to avoid what they're allergic to. There are a number of risk factors for fatal reactions that have really shown up in virtually all cases of food-induced fatalities. And those are, if you have peanut and tree nut allergy, for reasons that we partly understand but don't understand terribly well, they are better than other foods at causing these more severe reactions. The second is having asthma along with your food allergy. So if you are someone that has um, asthma, especially significant asthma, especially not well-controlled asthma, along with your peanut and tree nut allergy, we do want to recognize that risk and treat reactions more aggressively. People that have a prior anaphylaxis, prior severe reactions, obviously need to be treated more aggressively. Most fatalities show up in adolescents and young adults. We believe that is a combination of at least two factors, the first being that in most cases, as I mentioned, peanut and tree nut allergy does become somewhat more severe through childhood, so that you might actually be at your peak level of reactivity at an adolescent or young adult. And we think the rest of the reason that this risk increases is really more behavioral, that uh, patients in that age group are more out on their own. They may be taking more chances. There may be risk-taking behavior with their foods, just like there may be with their driving and other habits. And they may be a little less careful or a lot less careful about having epinephrine on hand to be ready to treat a reaction. Then the last risk factor is the one I talk about the most, and I talk about it the most because it, it, it is the one that's under our control. I cannot control whether my patient has a peanut allergy. I cannot control whether they have peanut allergy plus asthma. I can't control the fact that they're now an adolescent and heading off into the world. But I can try to prepare them to treat reactions promptly because uh, virtually all fatalities are associated with the delayed administration of, uh, of epinephrine. And the delay we think about is usually more than 30 minutes, especially more than 60 minutes. And what we're recognizing is that you can have, you can have a uh, much less good response to medication uh, after uh, the, the reaction has set in for, say, 30 to 60 minutes. The medication, including epinephrine, may not work as well. We had a message that not uh, all of the slides are showing up uh, in terms of the bottom line or two, so I will make sure to read those. The bottom line in this slide is that almost all deaths are due to respiratory failure. That means that most people are not dying because their heart shuts down. They're dying because their lungs shut down. And that's why we think this combination of asthma and food allergy is more dangerous because patients with asthma 
are more prone to this respiratory compromise that may go to the point of no longer being able to support breathing and death. Now, as we mentioned, we got hundreds of questions already, so I wanted to bring a few of them into the lecture at the appropriate time. The first question that comes up all the time, every day in, in, in the allergy clinic, how do you distinguish between symptoms of anaphylaxis and other illnesses? For example, how do you know an anaphylactic reaction is not just an asthma attack? My child gets random hives all the time. How do I know when it's a true reaction versus his random hives? My child gets stomach aches frequently. How do I know if it's just stomach cramps or the beginning of an anaphylactic reaction? How can I distinguish an anxiety attack from an anaphylactic reaction? And the answer is that the symptoms can be identical. And what we want to do more than anything is interpret the symptoms in the context of the overall situation and the chance that there's been a food exposure. So if your child gets random hives or stomach aches or both, and you're at home, they've been home the last several hours, and you know what they've eaten, and you're very confident they've not had an exposure, you can be quite confident this is their random hives or random stomach cramps. On the other hand, if you're out at a family party for the holidays, and the food has not been under your complete control, and they show up with these same symptoms, we would be more worried that this might indicate a food exposure and the beginning of an anaphylactic reaction. A second question that comes up frequently is, are there any clear differences in the way anaphylaxis progresses in children versus adults? And the overall answer is no. The thing that does change is that as people get into middle age and older adults, they're actually more prone to the cardiovascular or blood pressure effects of an allergic reaction. So one reason we don't see blood pressure being the cause of death in children is that the heart and blood pressure system in kids, and adolescents, and young adults is very strong and typically can keep going and going and going in spite of it a reaction. But as we hit middle age and older, uh, our blood pressure system may not be as sturdy, and uh, adults in that age group will be more prone to have the low blood pressure or anaphylactic shock. The last question on the slide, is there any way to find out how much allergen it would take to cause an anaphylactic reaction in our child? And this, again, is one of the most common questions. It's a completely reasonable question. Just the answer is we generally don't have a clear answer to it. We only have a clear answer, unfortunately, in the patient who comes in and has had 10 or 15 or 20 reactions. And we can really look carefully at each of their exposures and be able to say, OK, with this reaction, it was this much exposure, and that's how they reacted. But otherwise, I cannot look at a test result. I cannot look at a, a prior reaction or two and make any real prediction about what the reaction will look like or how much allergen it will take to cause that reaction. Some people want to undergo formal food challenges to get this answer. And in a food challenge, we're obviously intentionally feeding someone what they might be allergic to and at many times inducing an allergic reaction but it is not designed to answer the question posed here, which is how much allergen it would cause to take an anaphylactic reaction. And it doesn't answer that because when we do a food challenge, we stop the challenge at the first sign of a reaction. We don't push it to say, OK, how much more will it take to lead to anaphylaxis? That would not be an ethical way to practice. So even a food challenge does not typically answer that question. Now I want to focus on treatment for the next few minutes. This is uh, probably the biggest issue. And uh, the first uh, slide for treating anaphylaxis is always this one, that immediate treatment with epinephrine is imperative. There are not any contraindications to use epinephrine. As I mentioned, the failure or delay to use epinephrine is associated with bad outcomes, including fatalities. To make sure that it will not be delayed, it must be available at all times, and you must use an appropriate dose. And what that really means is that you need to be switching from a junior strength device to a regular strength device at an age that your doctor determines to be appropriate. The problem here is that when you go from a regular strength device, <clears throat> I'm sorry, from a junior device with 0.15 milligrams of epinephrine to the regular strength device with 0.3 milligrams, there's a, a size in between at which the junior device will be underdosing more and more. So remember, the junior device is a perfect dose for a child that weighs 33 pounds. Every pound above 33 
the junior will underdose a little bit more. And experts actually disagree on when we should exactly switch to the regular strength device, but somewhere around 50 to 55 pounds, we think that it is much safer to use the higher dose than it is to take the risk of underdosing by using a junior strength device. Once you've administered epinephrine, or while you're doing it, someone could be calling 911, and then you proceed to the emergency room. Now, another myth that I want to uh, deal with is that epinephrine is a dangerous drug, and we hear this all the time. The truth is epinephrine is a very safe drug. The risk of the reaction far outweigh any risks. That extra caution is only needed for elderly patients or no those with known heart disease. And then one of the greatest myths within this bigger myth is that you go to the emergency room not because you've gotten epinephrine. I think everyone thinks, I better not give the epinephrine because then I have to go to the emergency room. It has nothing to do with the reason you go to the emergency room. You could give your child a shot of epinephrine right now, and I wouldn't say go to the emergency room, unless they're having a reaction. It is the reaction that should bring you to the emergency room, because you may need additional medications or further management to take care of that reaction if that first dose or two of epinephrine did not completely reverse the reaction. Now, there's additional treatments, and I've broken those into things that it should include and things that it might include. I still recommend that an antihistamine be given. Antihistamines have no life-saving capacity, so it's really more to control the more minor symptoms like hives or itching. But what we do see sometimes is a child who got epinephrine appropriately, did not receive any antihistamine, and 30 or 45 or 60 minutes later, when the epinephrine is worn off, you will see hives show up, not dangerous necessarily, but certainly very worrisome, I think that giving the dose of epinephrine up front will typically prevent that. We typically do give a dose of steroids like prednisone. One of the things that happens wrongly in the emergency room with most reactions is that patients are often sent home on an extended course of prednisone, typically a five-day course like we might use in someone with an asthma attack. But the reality here is that a single dose in the emergency room, maybe two doses at most, is adequate for anaphylaxis. And as I mentioned earlier, once the reaction has calmed down, it is really calmed down, and you don't need to be giving more drug in most instances the next day. You should repeat epinephrine if symptoms persist or increase. How soon? Well, certainly as quickly as five minutes if things are bad. But what we'll often see is things may look better for 10 or 15 minutes because the epinephrine did work initially but began to wore off. But any time the symptoms are persisting or increasing, an additional dose of epinephrine should be given. We should observe for that minimum of four hours, and we should obviously arrange for follow-up care and make sure people have been provi provided with a prescription for epinephrine and education about its use. There's some may includes as well for anaphylaxis. A lot of times people will use a, there's a different type of antihistamine called a, a histamine 2 blocker, an H2 blocker. These are medications that are typically used for reflux or acid suppression like Pepsid or Tagamet. And they're often put on anaphylaxis regimens, but we don't think they're critical and, and don't always need to be used. You may need to get oxygen. You may have to have your airway managed by having a tube put into your airway. You may need intravenous fluids, especially if you're having a low blood pressure. And if your blood pressure has really become a problem, you may need to have a medication called a vasopressor to support your blood pressure. Now, I did not put on this slide. Uh, using an asthma inhaler, and it probably should be on here, but I actually shy away from this because, in general, when you're having an anaphylactic reaction, respiratory symptoms should be treated with more epinephrine. So it wouldn't be wrong to have uh, uh, albuterol on this slide as an, as an inhaler or nebulizer, um, but the reason I didn't put it on there is because I think this is a potential risk to think that we can treat respiratory symptoms of anaphylaxis with an asthma medication and uh, <clears throat> the uh, epinephrine does everything that albuterol can do, but albuterol does not help relieve the swelling in the airway, especially the swelling in the throat that may be the most dangerous component of an anaphylactic reaction. So if you have uh, albuterol in your treatment plan, it's not wrong at all to have it there, uh, but we should never think that it's a substitute for epinephrine. So I'll throw in here a few questions about treatment. The first, does repeated use of epinephrine cause immunity to it? 
And the answer is certainly not in anything less than the extreme and probably not even in the extreme. Now, by extreme, we have no idea what would happen if someone, say, got uh, six or eight doses of epinephrine uh, every day for six months. We have no idea what would happen because no one ever needs to do that. But if someone received epinephrine, say, six times in a year, we know it would work equally well all six times. I know it would work equally well if someone needed it 20 or 30 times in a year. Hopefully that doesn't happen. But you will not get immunity uh, to any usual use of epinephrine. Secondly, if a person is having an anaphylactic reaction and doesn't respond to epinephrine, is there anything that a hospital can do at that point? The answer is absolutely yes. Now, there are cases where the reaction has gone too far by the time the patient gets to the hospital that there is nothing more to do. But if, for example, someone was still having breathing problems after getting epinephrine, it is possible in those cases to put a breathing tube in place or to put a tracheostomy in place to make sure that air is still being provided um, uh, into the lungs to maintain breathing. If someone's having a low blood pressure because of their reaction, that epinephrine didn't stabilize, IV fluids and the use of these other medications can be extremely helpful. So uh, thankfully, in most instances, if we've done the appropriate home management of an anaphylactic reaction, the response you get in the emergency room is, what are you doing here anyway? Your child looks fine. And the truth is they look fine because you treated them appropriately, and that in most instances a single dose of epinephrine along with the dose of antihistamine will completely reverse the reaction. So they do look fine, but it doesn't mean they shouldn't be there. But you want them there for that 20% of the time that additional medications are needed. Another question that came in several times is, are EMTs, um, uh, ambulance uh, emergency medical technicians, trained to handle, uh, and handle anaphylaxis? And the answer here is certainly yes, and the second part of it is, well, not, not completely. And when you really think about how, how this works, is certainly EMTs, they have a lecture on anaphylaxis, and if they've worked for a year, they've probably seen it a handful of times. If they work for 10 years, they've seen it 10 handfuls of times. But being truly trained hand anaphylaxis is a complicated scenario, so we wouldn't think that any EMT is, is fully, fully capable. Now, I'll give a couple examples. In my uh, clinic and research staff, I have a, a group of incredibly experienced nurses who work with me on taking care of patients and doing research on food allergy. They are incredibly well trained in anaphylaxis, and they have a lot more medical training than an EMT has. They're not completely trained. They still want me around when something's going wrong. And when I have a new trainee come in my program who's already a board-certified pediatrician, they're not, they're not completely trained to handle anaphylaxis. They're really only partially trained, and they need to see it many times before they can be in that completely trained category. The last question on this slide is, aside from a delayed administration, are there any other factors that would prevent epinephrine from stopping a reaction? And there are, there are a few. Uh, one of them, as I mentioned, uh, is that there will be some reactions that are just too severe. And when we treat any disease, any allergic reaction, if we're treating an asthma attack, if we're treating an outbreak of hives, we really think of the, the treatment as a battle between how strong the medicine is versus how strong the reaction is. And there will be instances, potentially, when the reaction is just stronger than the epinephrine. But in terms of preventable things, the two that we would mention would be if the epinephrine was not delivered appropriately, if the injection did not get into the muscle, the problem there can be if someone is very overweight, the, uh, the needle is not long enough to get through the fat tissue and get medication into the muscle. So that could be a problem. That person may need to have a different delivery device to make sure they're getting the medication where they need to be. Then the other issue that I alluded to is getting an appropriate dose and this is one of the uh, problems we have with the epinephrine devices that are available is we only have the two strengths. And we've talked uh, many times over the years about having other strengths of devices available. There's been a lot of interest in having a junior, junior strength, something to be using for babies. But what I always tell the companies is what we need is a middle strength. Um, uh, the, the group that I think is really at risk is that person who's, say, between 40 and 60 pounds, where the junior is underdosing more and more and more for every pound that child gains. So this is another reason to have two devices around. So if you have a 60-pound child, 
um, uh, with an EpiPen junior that is not inappropriate, but they certainly might need a second dose more often than someone who is 60 pounds and has a regular strength epinephrine device. Now, making treatment decisions is, uh, is why you're here. It's what you uh, want me to tell you, and this is something that you do need to work out on a very individual basis with your physician um, about you or your child's uh, uh, allergy and how they should be treated. But there are a number of things that we take into account when we make treatment decisions, when we develop an action plan, uh, and those would be their prior reaction history it can be very helpful, but I also told you it can be remarkably unhelpful. We could be very reassured by a prior reaction history that never had anything that was scary or severe or life-threatening, um, uh, whereas the next reaction could be easily scary or severe or life-threatening. The other big problem we have is that um, for the vast majority of our patients, we're not actually dealing with a simple, single food allergy. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we come to treatment plans in the, in the later question and answers. But what I really mean by that is that uh, a typical patient that, I, that I'll see tomorrow uh, is going to have three or four or six or ten food allergies. And they may have a, a milk allergy that they're mostly outgrowing. They may have an egg allergy that's still pretty strong. And they may have a peanut allergy that is real strong. And they may have tree nut allergy. Um, uh, of which they have two tree nuts they're highly allergic to, and two it's sort of in between, and four they may not be allergic to. So what do you do when that child picks up a cookie and bites into it, and you don't know whether it only had some milk, whether it had milk plus egg, or maybe it had peanut or tree nut along with the milk and egg? If we knew it only had milk and he's on his way to outgrowing his milk allergy, that's probably not going to be too severe. If we knew it had egg and he's still got a pretty strong egg allergy, it's more likely to be severe, but the real message is, even for that one child, I can't necessarily give a single blanket treatment plan. And on the other hand, I don't want to give the school six sheets of paper and say, do this for a milk reaction, do this for an egg reaction, do this for a peanut, do this for cashew and pistachio, and do this different plan for almond, walnut, and pecan. That's not realistic either. The second part of treatment decision is coexistent asthma. And I've made the point several times now that having asthma does influence risk of reactions. I also made the point, though, that it's not a consistent risk in many instances. So people may be much more at risk when their asthma is more flared, like during a viral illness, and may not present a great deal of extra risk if someone otherwise has very mild asthma. The main thing that we use to um, uh, kind of define a treatment decision, though, is really based on degree of symptoms for most people. And we're talking um, in very general terms about symptoms that are very localized versus those that are more generalized. And what I mean by this, and I think it's in a fairly easy way to try to conceptualize this and try to explain it to a grandmother or babysitter, is that if there is a reaction going on um, and we don't have any of these uh, uh, up above risk factors like a history of a severe reaction or asthma, and we're not automatically giving epinephrine, and he did bite into that cookie, and he only has four or five or six hives around his mouth, and he's otherwise acting fine, it would be reasonable in that case in most instances to consider that a relatively mild reaction. However, if that reaction begins to spread and looks something more generalized, something more systemic, anything more than localized, we would deal with that as being a far more dangerous situation. That means to me, that if the reaction is still only involving the skin, okay, we still only have hives, it has not affected the breathing or anything else, but as a generalized hive reaction, I would definitely want epinephrine given. I, I would not wait around and see how much more generalized that reaction is going to become. So we get into a lot of discussion about two system reactions. Okay, if you have skin plus breathing, if you have skin plus GI, you, you then have anaphylaxis and need to use epinephrine. And that, that makes sense, although if you only had breathing, you better use, you better use epinephrine. Uh, that's a single system, but it's really dangerous, so you're not going to wait and see if the skin gets involved before you have epinephrine. If you have three hives and vomit once, that's probably not so bad. Um, if you vomit repeatedly, it, then it is more likely to be significant. And if you haven't done it yet, please download the FAIR action plan that was just revised in August after 
literally a, a year of work revising an excellent form. The prior, prior form was really excellent. Uh, this took a year of work um, among some very dedicated people, including uh, uh, not just allergists, emergency room doctors, but parents and other healthcare uh, uh, workers. Um, and what we've tried to do with that form is to present something that really does help you think about those symptoms that really are on the right-hand side of that form and the mild category, those that are more severe, and give you something that you can really sink your teeth into and help make these treatment decisions. Um, so if you've not downloaded that yet, please go to that after the webinar. Have a look at that and see if it can improve either your child's action plan or even your understanding of how you should treat the next reaction you deal with. Another myth, and this is something we hear a lot, most of you don't believe this, so I'm, pre I'm preaching the choir here, but the myth is anaphylaxis is easy to avoid if you know what you're allergic to. And one of the reasons we're really, really working on treatment for food allergy, ways to try to do something different than what we're doing, is that this is just completely wrong. And most cases of anaphylaxis are, are obviously not planned. In fact, most happen in people who are incredibly diligent about avoiding what you're allergic to. So that most cases of anaphylaxis are due to accidental exposures, and especially when we're dealing with such common foods that are in our lives and our diets on a daily basis, it is pretty easy to see uh, how a child might accept from a very trusted teacher um, a cookie or piece of candy uh, that uh, you would have screened, but your six-year-old child didn't know to screen, um, or uh, how your teenager who would know to screen it decides not to screen it because they um, are, are more prone to taking a risk and not wanting to stand out as having a problem and asking these kinds of questions. So we need to assume at all times, and on the next slide, that we always have to be prepared to treat a reaction. The um, uh, most important theme about this is complete avoidance is impossible, or in parentheses, reactions can never be predicted. And we need to remember that on a daily basis. We can't say, I don't plan to eat when I go to my friend's house, so I don't need to bring my epinephrine with me. We can't say, I've eaten at this restaurant a hundred times, I know they know what they're doing, and not bring your epinephrine with you. This is something where we always have to assume uh, that something is going to happen because the worst situation is being caught off guard with something that we're not ready to deal with. The second is we have to have an emergency action plan. We have to know what to do in the event of that accidental exposure. The third, obviously, is we have to have self-injectable epinephrine on hand at all times. Uh, we've stressed over and over how important it is to use epinephrine, and just as importantly, how important it is to use it promptly early in a reaction. So if that epinephrine is back at home when, you're, when your child's at a friend's, it doesn't do you any good. Even if it's in the car 15 minutes away from where you are in a theme park, it doesn't do you any good. It needs to be on your person, ready to go at all times. And then not just you parents, but all caregivers have to be trained on the action plan and on the epinephrine use. So I'm going to summarize a few things and then go on to a, a, a lot more questions. Uh, so the, the uh, summary uh, is that anaphylaxis can vary widely. It can vary from something that's relatively mild to completely fatal. Mob reactions can be self-limited. They may pass on their own. We don't want to tempt fate and see if that happens. But you cannot predict at the beginning of a reaction what that reaction is going to look like five or 10 or 15 minutes later. And me as a physician who has seen hundreds, actually thousands of cases of anaphylaxis, I can't predict what a reaction is going to look like five or 10 minutes later. The time course is that unpredictable. We really don't know what it's going to do. I can't look back. And again, I'm talking in many instances about the reactions I've seen where we've known what we gave them because it was in a food challenge. We know how they reacted before. I know the dose I gave them. I know what that dose did previously, but I can't tell what that dose is going to do today. As I mentioned, there are some clear risk factors for severe or fatal anaphylaxis. And remember, those are peanut and tree nut allergy. It doesn't mean uh, to take a big sigh of relief that your child only has milk and egg allergy. Those can be dangerous and fatal as well. But peanut and tree nut are usually associated about 80% of the time with fatal reactions. The second of those risk factors was asthma. The third was having prior anaphylaxis. The fourth was being a teenager or young adult. 
And the last, and again, the most important, was they are to give epinephrine promptly. Fourth bullet is that anaphylaxis can be reduced but are not fully preventable. We can reduce them by taking care to avoid what we're allergic to, but accidents will happen. And the last is that anaphylactic deaths are almost all preventable, and I would love to have this slide say anaphylactic deaths are completely preventable, but we know they're not. We know that availability and use of epinephrine is the key ingredient to success. We know that's what prevents anaphylaxis from causing death in the vast, vast majority of reactions. But we do know, unfortunately, of a few cases where epinephrine was given promptly and there was still a fatal reaction. So I'm going to go on now to some questions again that have come in over the last few days. Um, we're going to uh, uh, hopefully have time to take a few more questions at the end that have come in um, as I've been talking here. But let me move on to some general anaphylaxis questions, then some treatment questions, and I'll talk a little bit about research that we're doing um, uh, and uh, try to bring you up to date on that. So the first is, are people with asthma more at risk of fatal anaphylaxis? And um, I put this in as a question, even though I was covering it in the talk, because it is an important concept. The answer is yes. Uh, and again, the answer is because the main reason that people die of anaphylaxis is because their airways shut down. And because of the underlying asthma, your airways are likely to be more sensitive to an allergic reaction. And in fact, when most people um, uh, have undergone uh, uh, autopsy after dying of anaphylaxis, the appearance in the airways is that of asthma. It's not that the throat is full and shut. It's that there was a severe asthma attack uh, that uh, 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 under the eyes of the uh, pathologist in the microscope is very hard to distinguish what triggered that attack. Um, and people without asthma can do that whole process uh, but it is more common in those with asthma. Second question here, are some allergens more likely to cause anaphylaxis? And um, again, we made the point that peanut and tree nuts, for reasons, that, again, we don't understand, uh, are particularly good at causing anaphylaxis. But let me run through the other most common food allergens, because we've not done that here today. We've talked about milk and egg a number of times. And milk and egg allergy um, uh, may fall into a group that is uh, on the lesser end of the spectrum, may be easily outgrown. And I'll mention in a moment, there are some people even with milk and egg allergy who can eat that food as long as it's been fully baked or extensively heated and only react if it's an uncooked form. Of the other most common food allergens, uh, wheat and soy can cause very severe anaphylaxis. And some of my patients with wheat allergy are among the most dangerous patients. And all of these can cause a reaction that's every bit as severe as somebody's peanut or tree nut allergy. We see a lot more shellfish allergies. People grow up to adulthood. But in adults, shellfish are the most common cause of allergic reactions and the most common cause of anaphylaxis. The third question here is, does a risk of an anaphylactic response increase with each exposure to an allergen? And I think I've made the point, but again, I put this in as a question because it is such an important point. The answer is absolutely not. The next reaction is completely unpredictable. And it is unpredictable for all of the reasons we went over, but the most important being that the biggest variable in that next reaction will be the dose of exposure. And since we have no idea what that dose of exposure will be, we can't predict the reaction severity. Think back again to the kind of examples I was giving. If, if uh, this reaction occurred to a contaminated cookie that had a 1 one hundredth of a peanut, and the next reaction occurred to eating a full cookie with well-disguised peanut that had the equivalent of five peanuts in it, that reaction just had a 500-fold higher dose and will be much more severe than the one before. So again, you cannot take any reassurance that a last reaction wasn't severe. If someone's had a huge exposure with only a mild reaction, that actually is, um, uh, in our hearts, a little bit reassuring. But because these allergies can change over time, even that wouldn't make us say, throw away your epinephrine. People commonly ask uh, about uh, places, uh, and particularly those where there are lots of peanuts or tree nuts um, uh, around, like ball games, airplanes, and other places with lots of nuts. And as a general rule, uh, because ingestion is the main route of exposure that poses risk, being around nuts is not going to be dangerous. Now, 
We did mention you can have airborne reactions, and airborne reactions can occur. They will typically only happen, though, if uh, the peanut and nuts are being disturbed in a way to create a dust, and if you are in a very confined space. So if you think about how that might happen, you will definitely get more peanut allergen in the air if you're cracking open nuts, especially if you're throwing the nuts on the floor and walking on the shelves. Each of, the, each of those activities may create some dust that does contain allergen. And if you're in a confined space, so if you're in the waiting area of a restaurant and everyone is cracking open peanuts, and the floor of that waiting area uh, has an inch thick peanut shell on it, uh, that is a place where you could have a dangerous airborne reaction. That same amount of peanut at a ball game, though, virtually never causes problems. In the outdoor air, it's very rare to see true airborne reactions. Now, in airplanes, if everyone was cracking open nuts, airplanes would be a scary place. But the truth is that just by opening bags of peanuts, there's very little peanut allergen getting into the air. And we can't say it's a zero risk situation. I can't say that ball games are zero risk. I can just say they're very low risk. And for me and my peanut allergy, I don't worry about ball games or flying at all. I have no concern about it whatsoever. If my patients want to avoid ball games or be on peanut-free flights, I don't just, uh, say that's wrong, although I think that normalizing life as much as possible and finding a cooperative airline that won't serve peanuts, at least for peace of mind, may be a reasonable um, uh, approach to uh, be uh, less anxious and still enjoy a family trip or vacation. Now the next question um, is a, 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 a personal, personal question to me about uh, my prior anaphylactic reactions, and can I describe uh, what me or someone with this type of reaction may be feeling? And um, I can tell you that um, I've been uh, very fortunate uh, going nearly 20 years now since my last anaphylactic reaction, but my memory of my last reactions is still incredibly vivid, so this is something that sticks with you. Uh, and I can tell you that my reactions, uh, uh, of which I've had five or six in my lifetime in the very severe category requiring epinephrine, one of them requiring multiple shots of epinephrine, all look different. None of them look the same. One had a very abrupt onset. One took 20 or 30 minutes. One had a lot of GI symptoms. All of them, thankfully, gave me an immediate reaction in my mouth so that I had a warning sign that I was eating a problem food eating a food that was supposed to be completely safe, promised to be safe, but while I was eating it, recognized that my mouth was really itchy and I knew something was wrong and then could intervene, obviously to stop eating, but also to begin treatment. And since I have this history of severe reactions, I will immediately administer epinephrine. There'd be no reason for me to wait at all. Some other questions about treatment. Should RAS, the blood test, or skin test scores be used to change an emergency care plan? If not, what are they useful for for a severity standpoint? The answer to the first question is absolutely not. They have no bearing on an emergency care plan. The answer to the second is that they have very little use from a severity standpoint. So these are valuable tests to make a diagnosis. Uh, they're problematic even making a diagnosis but they are uh, truly not useful in designing your child's emergency care plan. You can have people with low scores and severe reactions, people with high scores and less severe reactions. If you take a large group, if you took 100 people with peanut allergy, you would see somewhat more severe reactions than those at the very high end of the scale, but you would see dramatic exceptions at either end meaning you would see some people at the very high end of the scale who have very minor reactions and some people at the very low end of the scale with very severe reactions. So we have never, and until we get better tests, never will devise our action plan around a test score. Next question is, can a person's allergy severity worsen to the point that their anaphylaxis plan should change? And the answer is absolutely, positively yes. And one of the most important things we do is that every time a reaction uh, happens, we want to review that reaction. And we review it from several standpoints. And one of them is we want to just think about how it happened. Is that a situation that could be avoided the next time? Uh, there are always lessons to be learned from a prior reaction uh, that may help the next one. But another one is we want to really think about what was done during the reaction. Was it done 
consistent with or not consistent with the action plan that we've established, and uh, uh, was the reaction different than what we expected? Now, we may get very, very good news. We may get news that this child has virtually outgrown their milk allergy because they just got a whole big slug of milk and they barely reacted. That would downgrade their action plan. But more so, we want to be in um, uh, <clears throat> the knowledge of worse reactions to be able to upgrade the care plan to have a more aggressive treatment plan if someone is presented with a more severe reaction than what we anticipated. Can antihistamines help after epinephrine is given? Uh, the answer I provided earlier is that they have no life-saving capacity, but they can help. They can help some of those more mild nuisance symptoms. And as I mentioned, we've seen people get epinephrine up front in a reaction, look very good, and then get hives later. And I think that giving the antihistamine up front may help some of those, uh, prevent some of those later hives from happening. The next group of questions all relate to the, uh, the tragedy that happened over the summer with a 13-year-old. Most of you know about it, but if you don't, it was a 13-year-old with a known peanut allergy who ate uh, a Rice Krispie treat, was at a camp with her parents, um, uh, knew she was eating something that she shouldn't have, uh, took Benadryl immediately. About 20 minutes later, by all reports, <clears throat> uh, uh, felt difficulty breathing. And in spite of getting um, an, an initial shot of epinephrine then, another one very shortly after, and another one a little bit later, uh, went on to have a fatal episode. So the first question here, is it possible she just got too much epinephrine? Was it the reaction or, or, or was it the epinephrine that caused her heart attack? Now, we don't believe she died of a heart attack. Really, she, do, she died of respiratory failure that led to her heart stopping in all likelihood. But it was not the epinephrine. We're sure of that. You could not kill someone with three shots of epinephrine. Next question, is it ever worth giving oral antihistamines if that might mean losing time to administer epinephrine during what rapidly progressed to an anaphylactic reaction? And clearly, if we knew that reaction was progressing rapidly to anaphylaxis, we wouldn't wait around and give an antihistamine. But if we're in one of these situations where we interpret that this might not be such a severe reaction, giving an antihistamine at that moment may be completely appropriate. Uh, having the epinephrine immediately on hand to administer if the reaction progresses at all. The last two questions, again, relate to the same case, really. Have treatment protocols changed recently? Will they change based on the Natalie G case? And then back to the FAIR anaphylaxis care plan. It includes a box that says, if check, give epinephrine immediately if the allergen was definitely eaten, even if there are no symptoms. In light of Natalie G's death, shouldn't this box be checked for everyone? And this is a very reasonable question. I still believe the answer is no, and the reason is that we need to individualize care plans. There are lots of patients I have where I check that box. There are patients where it should certainly be checked based on their own individual characteristics. But again, back to my typical patient that has a milk allergy that's not so bad, an egg allergy that's pretty bad, a peanut allergy that's really bad, and two tree nut allergies that, that are really bad and others that are not so bad, why would I give the same care plan for any reaction that happens. So I really would like to be able to individualize that based on the specific symptoms of that exposure uh, and whether the reaction is progressing or not. So I think the Natalie G death is a very, very sharp wake-up call that we need to be giving epinephrine very promptly. I think it uh, is teaching us a huge lesson, uh, but my answer to this um, is that the care plan, uh, as it's been constructed, is still reasonable and appropriate to have a side of the plan that only includes antihistamine initially with epinephrine on hand. I think we have time for about, what, 20 seconds, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, first, can anything be done to reduce sensitivity? No. Is there an upcoming cure for, uh, that we're excited about? We're very excited about treatment approaches, very, very excited. But we also know this has got a long ways to go. There's a lot of research to be done. Immunotherapy or desensitization is showing promise, but it is far away still from being ready for, uh, for general use. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that in the next eight or 10 years, we will have this worked out to a place that it could be um, uh, uh, really available for general widespread use, but it's really not ready for that now. And in terms of uh, factors to place someone in a desensitization study, it's really someone who's not going to outgrow the allergy on their own. If I think they have a chance of outgrowing it, I would happily, happily let their body do that naturally, uh, but would not want to um, put them in to a research study where we're actually putting them at some risk 
uh, if they might be able to outgrow the allergy naturally. One more question, Mike. Are we done? Sure. Well, let me do one more. That works for you. You want to do one of those? Sure. Uh, so one of the uh, questions that have come in, does the severity of a reaction depend at all on the form of the protein, for example, drinking milk versus dairy in a baked good? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I, I mentioned very briefly before that there's a large group of kids with a milk allergy who are highly allergic to milk in the uncooked form but can tolerate it uh, rather well, uh, often completely well, once it's been ex extensively heated or fully baked. So there are, uh, this is another of these individual characteristics that you want to work out for your specific allergy with your doctor, because that child might not only be at low risk eating a piece of pizza, they may be at no risk eating a piece of pizza, even though eating ice cream after their pizza could be very dangerous. Wow, well, this one I think is a pretty easy question, so I'll give you this one too. Will someone be able to speak while on anaphylaxis? Yeah, so uh, people can generally function very well while on anaphylaxis, and you could have such airway swelling that you can't speak, your voice gets so hoarse that you're not audible, uh, but that is a very unusual situation. So thankfully, during anaphylaxis, people are generally functional to the, to the point that they can speak um, uh, and have not become unconscious early in the reaction, can still vocalize, can still handle an epinephrine device, give their own injection, uh, or whatever else may be needed to get the process going. Great. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Wood again. I know I've gotten several comments uh, through the system that this was a great presentation. Uh, we will uh, make the webinar available very soon, uh, hopefully a week or so after this, that anyone can view online and share. Um, and again, thank you all for attending. Um, just a preview of our next webinar, which will be uh, coming up on Wednesday, November the 6th. It was called Safely Navigating the Restaurant Scene by Chef Joel Schaefer, owner and trainer of Allergy Chefs Incorporated, uh, generously sponsored by Skeeter Snacks. Uh, member registration will open on Friday, October the 11th, and then full open registration for non-members will begin on October the 21st, and all that information will be available on our website when it's, uh, when it's ready. So again, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, that concludes our webinar, and we hope that you'll join us again soon.